This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See you, Brad? It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. With Nenshi as mayor again and arena uncertainty still looming here in Calgary, one thing is certain, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're here to talk more Flames hockey. How you doing, Matt? Good. It's interesting to see the Flames off to a 4-2 and two record to start the season. Well, you and I chatted last week, and we chatted a little bit about the uh, the win in Anaheim, the big win where the Flames shattered this streak and won in Anaheim. And we pretty much said if they can win that game, they can win anything. And, well, two out of three ain't bad. No. Although that one game, boy, six six nothing, that's not good. Well, let's uh, talk about one that we did win first, and that was a 4-3 win over the LA Kings. Matt, I know you were tweeting on Twitter at the time, and one of the things you said during this game was, now I know what it looks like to watch a contender. Yeah, well, when the Flames are rolling four lines and playing effective hockey, they can just obliterate the opposition. And in the first period of that game, they obliterated Los Angeles. The problem is that after the first period, they stopped playing until the middle of the third period. And the, and a team like L.A. is able to come back pretty easily and take advantage of you if you're not playing at 100%. Yeah, and I have to make a note. Dustin Brown, what a recovery from after being basically a buyout candidate under Daryl Sutter. He's got a whole new life with the new coach. You know, I liked Dustin Brown when he was younger. I know that he kind of dropped off with Sutter, and I wasn't sure if he was just you know, not a great player or he wasn't aging well or if it was the coach. And I think now we know that maybe he just didn't play well in a Sutter system. Well, we saw the same thing with Brent Sutter and Jay Bolmeister the first year that Bolmeister was here. Like, he was terrible. And it's because Sutter didn't utilize him properly. And perhaps that may have been part of the problem with Dustin Brown. Who knows? Yeah, Dustin, is Dustin Brown still wearing the C there in uh, LA? No. No. He was for a number of years. Yeah, I think it's Kopitar now, but I'm not sure. Brown got two goals, both in the third period, his second and third of the year. And, you know, you're right. Dustin Brown looked good in this one. I thought on the Flames side, Matthew Kachuk had a really good game here. He also got his first and second goals of the year. And I thought if one Flame really stood out to me, it was Kachuk. Yeah, for sure. And he excels when he's being himself. And... In the third period, we saw the, him interfering with Jonathan Quick after a whistle, take, took his mask off while being surrounded by five Kings players, and he had fun. <laughs> and that's so, he has to play on an edge in order to be successful. And we saw last year when he was getting into it with Doughty a bit that the team told him to like ease off on that and he struggled after that and i think kachuk needs to be a fun player to play against in order for him to be in the game and it's not a surprise that that was the most kachuk like performance of the season and he scored two goals in the game there's a balance there i mean that is part of kachuk's game and you can't ask him to change that game that's part of the reason we draft him that's part of what makes him the player that he is but i do think maybe sometimes last year especially the dowdy stuff maybe he went a little too far maybe he was agitating when he shouldn't have been and i think when the flames asked him to cut back on it again it was maybe too much they went so i think he has to find the limits of the NHL level. How far can you push and who can you push where? I know, and we're seeing the same thing with Michael Furland, where the team asked him to ease back off the hitting because he was getting a little injured from and banged up from time to time on throwing so many hits because they're trying to shoehorn him in the first line, but he's hasn't played like himself at any point this season because of that. 
Well, and I wonder if some of this is also the team. I mean, we saw them bring in Gadzik and we saw them bring in Glass, and we've seen the Flames have sort of a renewed appetite for toughness. And so I wonder if some of this comes back to whether it's the coach or the GM or Brian Burke or whoever it might be saying, you know, guys, we need you to bring some of that toughness back to your game. Yeah, it, it's interest. It'll be interesting to see, and if uh, especially with Furland, if he if his struggles continue because he's been removed from the first line and now he's injured, that if he continues to struggle, maybe he starts adding some of the physicality back to his game in hopes that that will rekindle the spark that made him effective last year. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we've talked in the past about is he really a bona fide first liner, and he just has good chemistry with the two guys that happen to be on our first line, Johnny and Monty. But I think, like you said, maybe dropping him down to the bottom six, letting him really get his game back might be the best thing for him right now. Yeah, and that's why I was in favor of signing Yager in the first place back at the beginning of summer, just because you didn't know if Furland was going to be able to ride shotgun with those other two guys and be able to be effective in that role. And thus far, he hasn't. So having Yager on the team does help just as an insurance policy instead of having a glaring need for a right winger all season. Well, mentioning Yager, this game in L.A. was also Yager's first game as a flame. I was a little bit surprised. I thought that that would come either in Ottawa or Carolina. Last week, I predicted Carolina. I thought they'd debut him at home. But they debuted him in L.A., and I don't know about you, I thought, you know what, this looks like a guy who hasn't played in a year. This looks like a guy who is 45. I thought all Yager can do is go up from here. I didn't think it was a great showing for number 68. It's one of those things. You can see the mind is there and the ability to do the right things. It's just... Like uh, with the first preseason game where Mike Smith allowed a lot of goals, it's all about timing and getting like your stick down in ready for a pass in time and stuff like that. And he was just a little out of sorts. And even in the other two games, he's still a little out of sorts, but you can still see that the skill and the mind is there. It's just a matter of working out all the little kinks to get things underway and i think getting familiar with his uh line mates as well oh for sure well let's move from la back to the saddle dome on friday night the calgary flames hosted the ottawa senators in a game that i think we all thought the flames would probably win and wouldn't run away from either team but this was disappointing to say the least the calgary flames lost six nothing to the senators and i think when i look and, back at and you know honestly this game was the best performance I've ever seen by a team on the losing end of a 6 nothing score. The Flames played good hockey. I mean, you know, it was a good hockey game, but they took too many penalties and they let the game get away from them. And when you give Ottawa or any team in the NHL as much power play time as the Flames Except gave Except for Vancouver. <laughs> you're going to lose. Oh, for sure. And that's the difficulty that the team faced was that they just took too many frankly dumb penalties uh, you know the refs are calling things and like in the early part of the game Ottawa got called for a, a chintzy slash and you can expect that th those types of calls are going to continue and yet the Flames were doing things that were penalties and they were making it easy for the refs to put their arm up and the Flames have to adapt to that. And unfortunately, it caused them to lose a game, which they probably would have lost anyway with how Anderson was playing. I don't know as if the Flames would have beat them under, like if there wasn't huge amounts of penalty trouble. But And I know that in the, in the end, I mean, it doesn't matter what the score is. It's still, you know, a win or a loss, but... I would have rather had them, you know, lose and have a closer than lose 6 nothing. Uh, it's also a wake-up call. So, uh, And the team itself, like uh, after the L.A. game, the coaching staff preached that you have to play tighter defensively and then they put up a 6 nothing loss. It helps to reinforce that, yeah, you guys need to play a little better. 
after the game, um, you know, the members of the media assembled to talk to Glenn Gullitson, and he said he was a little bit confused here because we saw sort of the same standards we were seeing in the preseason. I mean, even one of the penalties in the third was a face-off violation penalty. And he said, you know, they've got to decide, are we going to call this like we have in the regular season in the past, or are we going to call this like the preseason? He said that he was very confused by that officiating. So I wouldn't expect this to be the norm, but we saw this last year too, though. When the Flames got in penalty trouble, they pretty much always lost. And you and I would talk weekly where I would look at the number of penalties the Flames took, and if it was more than their opponent, generally they lost. So the this team has to play smarter hockey. They have to stay out of the penalty box and – you know, you got to know when to skate away and when to retaliate. Yeah, and thankfully their next opponent, the Vancouver Canucks, are a terrible, terrible, terrible hockey team. And that allowed the Flames to win, frankly. Well, let's talk about that one because that's the bright spot on the, uh, on the weekend. The Flames played back-to-back and visited their rivals in Vancouver on October 14th and got a 5-2 win over the Canucks. Uh, of note, Travis Hamanick got his first goals of flame, and Dougie Hamilton got his first goal of the year. Matt, thoughts on this one? Well, it's a continuation of our discussion. So many undisciplined, dumb penalties. It, again, if you're seeing a penalty and it's you're thinking it's a weak call, well then stop doing anything that might be borderline. And they didn't and until probably the middle of the second period and then finally they stopped doing it but thankfully Vancouver is a horrible hockey team and weren't able to capitalize and if we were playing even an average team I don't think the Flames win that game if we look in the Senators game the Flames had 19 penalty minutes to Ottawa's 11 and in the Vancouver game, the Flames had 18 penalty minutes to the Canucks. And I agree with you. The Flames were lucky. They were playing a poor team, and the, the Vancouver couldn't capitalize on those. But, yeah, I mean, if they keep taking that many penalties, this season's going to get away from them really quickly. Yeah, and I think that expands to a larger theme through the six games that they've played, where the team itself is out of sorts and they've benefited partially due to the fact that they have been playing some inferior teams and seeing how they're playing as a whole there's not really much of any difference between how they've started the season this year versus last year other than Mike Smith is playing as good as either Elliot or Johnson did at any point last year. I was going to say the only difference between this year and last year really is that we're putting up W's instead of L's. Yeah, and that's all due to Mike Smith. And like if the Flames against the Jets were playing against a goalie that was better than Steve Mason, I don't know as if the Flames come back in that game and win. Similarly, the LA game, if LA... Yeah, if they played a little better in the first period, we probably don't get two points. And if Vancouver wasn't horrible, same thing. So, you know, the Flames could, if they didn't have a little bit of luck on their side in terms of who we were playing against, you know, we could be talking about a 1-5 and start. And that's not good (laughs) at all. And we're lucky that, yeah, we're 4-2, and But the team needs to play significantly better, especially because the upcoming next six games are against teams that are actually good. Yeah, the Flames won't be able to sustain this kind of a record if they keep playing this way. It's going to fizzle out really quickly. And, I mean, I think if they keep playing like this, the season could slip away. Not necessarily make it so it's impossible to regain ground, but they might lose a lot of ground quickly and make it harder on themselves than they need to. Yeah, and thankfully with them having eight points in the bank, like I said at the start of the season, if they started the year five and five, I'd consider that success. So, you know, if they went one and three in the next four games, that would meet my qualifier. But you don't want to see 
them giving away any ground that they've made up and hopefully with the four day break they can work out all these little kinks and take it to Carolina I have a strong feeling over this four day break it's not going to be so much on ice practice I think the coach has got that part of his practice done I think a lot of it's going to be in the video room and looking at how do we avoid these kind of penalties going forward um you know, I don't know if it's just the Flames are undisciplined or they need to learn to walk away. Matt, do you have any insights on what does this team need to do to change, you know, staying out of the penalty box? Well, the main thing that they need to do to... Because the penalty is just stupid that they're taking. Yeah, the main thing that they need to do is focus on details. And especially when it comes to face-offs. When the center gets waved out, don't do anything that would precipitate don't you cheat taking the second a time. Yeah, don't take a penalty. So what if you lose the face off? Go get it. You know, it's not especially the one in Vancouver like that negated a power play. Okay, so what if you have to go back and get the puck from your zone? Ooh, you burned 15 seconds, but now instead you negated the chance entirely and for what? And it's just lack of attention to details in all aspects of the game. And frankly, a lot of the lines, there's lots of players on each line that have been out of sorts to start the year. And those specific players need to get going in order for the team to have success. Yeah, I think it's just a mental thing they'll work through. And, I mean, they have to. And I think, you know, you and I talked last year in the playoffs. I think that was a big reason the Flames got eliminated is they got pushed around by Anaheim, and it threw them off their game. And I think they have to realize the Flames, the way this team is built, is not meant to be a rough-and-tumble sort of bully team. This is a hockey team, and they're built to be a hockey team. And I think sometimes they have to say, okay, you know what? Yeah, we can push back a little bit, but if we just keep playing hockey, good things are going to happen. And if we try to, you know, play too aggressively, if we try to play like, you know, the Anaheim Ducks or, you know, the 80s Flyers or something like that, things aren't going to go our way. No, and if you look at the Flames... They have three very well, solidly built lines, which I think that they may be one of the few teams in the NHL that can say that their entire top nine is a solid group of players. There's not really any weak players in that group. So if the Flames can get in the habit of just rolling the line after line after line after line, like, you can really get the momentum going and play like the first period against L.A., where you're just running over the other team and just keep doing it and until the clock runs out. And if you do things in it such a manner that you're not getting off your own game and allowing the other team back in, you can just run over them. And with the Flames defense core as it is, between that and the goaltending, you can pretty effectively shut anybody down. It's just getting all the parts to be moving in the same direction in order for that to happen. And they're still out of sorts still and trying to figure that all out. And that's where we're seeing all of these mis mental mistakes. And not only can we shut them down, like you said, I think that for the first time in a while, the Flames have the roster and the ability to make teams play their game. In the past, we've seen a lot of times where the Flames have had to adjust to play their opponent's games to survive. And I think that once this team gets rolling, we can really make other teams play our way. You know, if they want to get chippy and they want to play aggressively, we can say, no, we're you know going to play hockey and we'll let you do that another time or you know, it's not going to work here because we're just not going to play that game. So I think if we yeah, look at this and roster... The, the, and the fact that the Flames have such a weirdly set-up team where we can play several different ways and a lot of balance between skill, toughness, tenacity, size, all of it, it and smarts on the ice, that we can not only dictate how we want to play but we can also respond to any specific type of team 
that comes in. Like in Anaheim, you can know how to play them because they're going to be a little thuggish and opportunistic, so you can mitigate those things. And, you know, you can still dictate how you're playing, but you can respond to how they're playing. So, Matt, after six games, looking at the roster, um, you know, with this kind of four days to reset things, if you were the coach, if you were Glenn Gullitson, are there any line changes you think you'd be making for when the Flames return to, to action this weekend? Um, I would move Troy Brower up from the fourth line onto the Sam Bennett line and put Curtis Lazar on the fourth line with uh, Glass and Stajan, and, and that's pretty much the only lineup move I'd make. So your four, your bottom six would look like what then? What, what would be your third line? Uh, my third line would be Versteeg, Bennett, Brower, and the fourth line, Glass, Stajan, and Lazar. And then that leaves Yager on the, the first line? We're yeah, and the, the 3M line. Out. Yeah, assuming Furlan's still out. So you think that Troy Brower's played well enough to get a promotion? Yes, I have. Wow. He has played exceptionally defensively, and I think he's earned enough uh, over the last handful of games that he deserves more responsibility. And he's earned his way back into having a shot in a top nine role. He's still a good player. And yeah, he struggled last year, and we've had long discussions on Troy Brower. But. You know, credit to him. He's, okay, I'm going to be the fourth line guy and the main penalty killer. Fine. And he did his job, and he was successful in helping to cut the chances against on the power play. Yeah, he's still making a couple of mistakes, but I think that you have to give him another shot in a scoring role to see if he can rebound entirely and... Having a different look with Sam Bennett and Versteeg might also help spark them a bit too. Yeah, you definitely could be right. Um, I think it's worth trying, and I think a team like Carolina might be the right team to do it with. I don't think that we can look at that as a permanent move because I don't think Yager can last in the first line forever, but at least until... I do. You think so? Yep. Okay. He, I mean, did, you... he did on Florida. There's no reason why he can't. Monahan, how do you say Monahan's not the fastest player anyway, so it's not like he's going to drag the whole team, the whole line down, because it's not like you have two Blazers and they're both dragging Yager around the ice. So it, that's not really their game plan anyway on that first line. So it, I don't see a problem with Yager sticking there. All right, we'll see what the coach ends up doing. Um, and you, so you think Lazar has a legitimate spot in the lineup? Um, yeah. Do you think just until Furlan comes back, or do you think you'd find a spot for him after that if he keeps playing the way that he is? If he keeps playing the way he is, I'd take Glass out of the lineup and tell Furlan to start hitting again <laughs> and join Lazar on the fourth line with Stajan and make it the best fourth line in the league. That sounds reasonable. Um, Matt, Cause I, it, it, you got to figure that when Furland was successful, he was playing with energy players. And he was, and we all fell in love with him too in the Vancouver series, where he was that gritty, nasty, you yeah. Know, checker and the you look at Lazar; he's a gritty checker guy who's fast and gets in your face a bit. Stajan is the smart, defensively responsible guy, and you have Furland there. It's a good fit where you have the wingers just creating havoc, and Stajan's there to be the responsible guy. See, the thing I think on that line, too, is I think Lazar has more offensive upside than Furland does. So if they're going to score, I think it becomes one of those things where Stajan becomes the setup man for Lazar on that line. Well, it's not like Furland's without skill either. You could have them both, all three of them, bouncing off of each other. Sort of sure. like the David Jones line, uh, Stajan and Furland line from that playoffs that you are referencing. For sure you could. I just think that if, if Furland's job is going to be to get nasty, he's often not going to be in position to, you know, get the goals. True. He's probably going to be more in the corners than right in front of the net. Any other changes you would make, whether it's to the lineup, whether it's to, you know, anything else about this team after six games, the way they're playing and a strategy they're using? I think that, like, how would you say, the the shots against, it, yeah, we've been surrendering a ton of shots, 
but we I have that calming really down been... as soon as this defense gets its its you know stuff together. Yeah, and not only that, they're limiting the dangerous shots. Like I, we haven't been seeing ten tons of breakaways. Like other than the Ottawa game where it was ten tons of breakaways, but you're not seeing those high level grade A scoring chances. Most of them are just them firing pucks on net just to try and get something going and you also have to look at teams that like when I've gone to games and that one of the things that I've noticed is the losing team ends up most of the time leading in the shot department anyway because they're trying to get back so they're just throwing anything at the net and hoping to win or get something going and I think that part of it, especially because the Flames have won four of the games, that the other teams have pushed to try and get the goal, get the equalizer, and the Flames are just keeping everything to the outside and Mike Smith's just absorbing everything and not allowing any juicy rebounds. So I think it's just a little bit of everything that's contributing to the shots against and that that will calm down to an extent see the way that i'm looking at the goals against is i think that the players have a new type of goalie they're not used to a goalie that plays the puck as much as smith so the defense no. has to adapt a little bit there and you know how they're dealing with things in, the, in their own zone i think also we've got new defensive pairings who just also need to adapt to each other and we're seeing that i mean i think you know, the last game in Vancouver, we saw the best um, night for Brody and Hamannick that we've seen. So I think as soon as those pairs start to click and they get in sync with Mike Smith, I think we're going to see the shots going way down. Yeah, and especially with Smith being able to pass the puck effectively, I think what you'll see is when the other teams are rushing into the zone is that the defenseman will try to like stop them at the blue line and force them to like dump the puck into the corner and if it goes behind the net Mike Smith's ready there to grab the puck and fire it out to either the defenseman or up the ice lots well, and in the and past that would have been a defenseman that had to grab it yeah and the flames haven't adapted yet to having somebody that's that effective where okay you can cheat a little bit by forcing things at the blue line instead of letting them have time and space to set up in the actual zone and it's little adjustments like that that take time it and it's all a learning experience and it, i'm not concerned over that i saw a couple times in the ottawa game when one of the defensemen would naturally go back to get the puck that smith was going for and as such he wasn't where he needed to be to cover the forward so the forward would get the puck and have a clear shot on net. Not a great shot, usually, but they'd have a shot they might not have had otherwise because the defenseman was not where they needed to be because Smith had that puck. Mm -hmm. And we've heard that it, Trill Living mentioned that Michael Stone, he said that was saying about last year having to make those adjustments because Elliot and Johnson didn't do that once coming from Arizona and like oh I have to go get that puck now and it's one of those things that it it just takes time and to adjust to those things and I'm getting paid that's three million dollars and you're making me go five feet to get a puck come on so hard done by <laughs> but no it, it's one of those things that with it's just we've adapting. seen this yeah we've seen this when hamilton first came here it took him a month or so to adapt then last year it took a month and a half for the team to get in sync with the new coach and it's the same kind of thing it's just getting all the detail working correctly and everybody on the same page it just it's frustrating but it takes time yeah, I think that by the end of the month, we'll see the Flames for what they really are, for better or for worse, I think. By the time Dallas rolls into town on the 27th, I think the Flames will have their bugs worked out and we'll really see what this team's got. 
It's not like last year where they need a month and a half in a new system. It's not like last year where there was a lot of intangibles. You know, we had Goudreau miss training camp and we had Monaghan with an injury. I think, you know, this team is pretty much ready to go. Like you said earlier, it's kind of just sanding off the rough edges. So I don't think it's going to take a month and a half for us to get up to where the Flames need to be. No, and thankfully they had an easy schedule to start the year. So that way they're not needing to beat the Dallases and the washington's and the pittsburgh's and all those teams that are coming up in the near future so the big talk this week matt is about not troy brower fans seem to have settled down with brower like you said he's looking good in the last couple games he's playing well so the big talk right now is about sam bennett and what do the flames do with sam bennett do they keep him on the center of the third line do they move him to the wing do they move him up does he center a goudreau line and you know I don't want to I don't want to give everyone the wrong impression. I don't think the Flames should give up on Bennett by any means. He's still young. He's got a lot of upside. But my biggest criticism about Bennett last year, and we're starting to see it already again this year, he doesn't seem to have the hockey sense the way I'd want him to. Like he takes dumb penalties and he puts the team in bad positions more often than not. He uses his stick for bad, not for good. Yeah. Well, he's and that's always hard to train. Yeah, he's always been one to take a lot of penalties like even in juniors he took a ton of penalties and I don't know how you fix that other than showing him like the things that he's doing wrong and why and hope that it goes in <laughs> it's tough because I mean I know we were happy you and I were watching the draft when he got drafted and we were really happy the Flames took him where they did but Looking back at some of the other players, I'm surprised that he went as high as he did because his hockey sense and that, you know, ability to take a penalty is just so overwhelming. Like, he just can't seem to stay out of the penalty box. And not for good reasons. Yeah, well, that draft was kind of weird in a way. And where you had centers that were probably too high. The Sams were both probably too high. And the wingers, Nylander and Ehlers specifically, were too low. But, yeah, it is what it is. I don't know. I don't I don't see it as being a bad selection by any stretch. It, no, I'm not saying necessarily it's a bad selection, but I just, I think it was an interesting, it was interesting that he went so high because that is the biggest, I guess, issue with Bennett's game that's glaring is the man can't stay out of the penalty box. Yeah, well... And it'd be one thing if he was a, a Furlan-like player or it was his job to agitate or a Kachuk-like player where it was his job to agitate. But he's not even an agitator. He just takes dumb penalties. Yeah. I know. It, it's one of those frustrating things that you hope he learns from. And there's not really much he can do. Either he will or he won't. And so I guess looking at, you know, Bennett right now, if you were a coach, what would you do with him? Do you think you bench him for a few games, try and get that through to him? Do you think maybe you um, move him to the wing and try to mitigate some of that? What would you do with this guy? I would not bench him because other than when he takes the penalties, he's playing a rather effective game. And people are going to be like, but he doesn't have any points. But that's not the points will come and his line has been kind of jumbled all season like the only constant's been Versteeg and both he and Versteeg have struggled a bit to start the year and I don't know Versteeg looks to me like what I expect from a you know third line veteran right winger true it, it's just that Bennett's trying to be a good all-around player and he's doing most of the things correctly uh, other than taking the penalties it's just the offense hasn't quite come yet although there have been chances it's just one of those situations where the player is trying to work out all the kinks in his game and it's taking time and as for moving him to the wing i you don't move him to the wing period you think you keep him at center it, 
you have to look at player values across the league. The number one thing that teams need are centers. And a mediocre center is better than a good winger in most cases. Because centers are that good centers are that hard to find. And that's why yeah, we have Jankowski in the system, and some fans have said, oh, we'll just bring Jankowski, stick him on the third line, and move Bennett over to the wing. And it, in a bubble, that makes sense. It If you're not talking player valuations and are trying to make the best team on the ice for, like, right this second, that is the right move. It's just for the long-term that's not the right move and especially like once you get past Jankowski in the system only uh Ruzitska the player the Flames drafted in the fourth round is a player that will stick as a center in the organization because all the other guys are a little on the short side of things and typically when they go pro they go get moved over to the wing so it's one of those situations where, like, okay, great, we have Monahan and Jankowski and Backland, but then we don't have anything else. And it, you, you create a huge hole in the organization by moving Bennett to the wing. And so between tanking his trade value and reducing, like, the overall organizational depth, it just doesn't make a lot of sense right now, especially when there's no need to make a decision one way or the other. So what about, I mean, in the preseason, we saw him and Johnny Goudreau being fairly successful together. I think one of the things I might try if I'm the coach coming into a team like the Hurricanes next is maybe breaking up the first line for a game. We've already got Furland out and potentially trying Goudreau, Bennett, and Yager. What do you think of that? That's the thing. Yager played well with Monaghan and Bennett in the Vancouver game, so I'd like to see that for like 8-10 games just to see if those parts work well together. But then that's moving and Bennett to the wing. No, that's leaving Monaghan with Yager and Goudreau oh, okay. and just leaving Bennett on the third line. And if you need to shake things up, Perhaps you switch up things with the 3M line, maybe moving Kachuk down to and Versteeg, swapping them out, possibly. If you're going to break up the 3M line, I think at this point you try Froelich on the first line again. No need with Yager there. I don't know. I, I know what you're saying about Yager There's being a lot, there, but that's... we also didn't think we were going to get the chemistry when we put Backlund and Froelich together. So to me, I'd say, you know, we saw Froelich on the first line late last year, too, and it worked out pretty well. So I think if you're going to try it, you might as well, if we're going to jumble oh, things, I know, and that's jumble And that's the, I know, and that's the thing. If, if the team starts to struggle and they're losing, then you can throw everything in the blender and mix and match and see if anything sticks. But despite our complaints about their start they're still four and two it's true. and yeah individual players are struggling a bit like sam bennett but all three of the main scoring lines are contributing so it even though it's not certain players aren't as much as others overall it's working so and you just have to hope that a guy like Bennett or Versteeg, instead of like that puck getting saved by the goalie or it hitting the post, maybe some of those shots start going in and they start getting on a roll by themselves instead of throwing everything in the blender. Let me ask you this, Matt. If Sam Bennett was not the fourth overall pick for the Calgary Flames in 2014. Let's say he was, uh, I mean, he's a bottom six forward right now. So let's assume he was a fourth, fifth, second, round. Ra second round pick. Sure. Sorry. Second or third. Let's go with, do you think we'd be having the same conversation? Do you think a lot of the scrutiny around Bennett is simply because people don't think he's, he's living up to where he is drafted? Well, look at Mark Jankowski, 21st overall selection. Not a huge amount of 
fanfare with the selection. Some people liked it, most didn't. And he just sat there for four years in college, and nobody really seemed to care too much. He was just doing his thing. And Bennett is younger than what Jankowski was when Jankowski won the national championship. Like, <laughs> it, he's still very young. Not 18-year-old Sam Bennett, but still very young. So, it's more expectations of, oh, well, Monaghan, he stepped right in and was awesome. Goudreau stepped right in, and he was awesome. Kachuk stepped right in, and he was awesome. So, Bennett should, too. But not every player is the same. And... In some aspects, like you also have to remember that Bennett missed a full year with the shoulder injury. It's one of those situations where we're still like two, three, four years away from there being a, a problem with Bennett. And I think that it's just that, oh, he was the highest draft pick in franchise history. That is the main sticking point. Because otherwise he's doing fairly good. Yeah, I mean, like if, he's, if I look he's at a him, very good defensive forward. Like he's one of the top defensive players on the team. If I look at, at if I look at Bennett outside of his draft position, you know, I mean, looking at some of the other guys in the team around him, you know, Versteeg was drafted 134th overall, Brower 214th overall, Matt Stajan 57th overall, Michael Furlan 133rd overall. Like if we take the draft position out of it and assume, like most guys in the bottom six, he's drafted in round two, three, or four. I think he's doing just fine as a third line center. We got him for under a million bucks this year and next, or under two million bucks this year and next year. I think you know what he's doing okay. And if you, there's not that pressure, the Lazar pressure that we saw in Ottawa that forced him to move, I think you know what he's a fine bottom six depth guy who has the potential to be more. And if not, and I think that the main thing that the Flames are trying to do with Sam Bennett is make him into chippy Michael Backlund where a very smart two-way player who can chip in 50 points and doesn't take anybody's crap and just is a good overall secondary scorer. So is that where the beard comes in? He's supposed to look tougher? Well, he did shave it, so, you know, which is disappointing because we wanted to see the ZZ top look in the playoffs. But Lumberjack Sam and Gage. Yes. <laughs> But, you know, like, I think if we look at, if we take the draft position out of it, if we take out that he was, like you said, the Flames' highest draft pick, and we take all that stuff out and just look at him with his position in the lineup, with the guys who are playing around him, I think he's more than serviceable. The price we got him for, he's more than serviceable. Dude. Oh, he's, if he was just random Joe Prospect, like, everybody would be like, oh, Sam Bennett's doing really good, and how great defensively he's doing. And, you know, maybe he might be a core piece down the road and instead of oh we should move him to the wing or trade him or this or that it, just have to be patient yeah i think this year's really a big year for bennett i think you know we've got him under contract this year and, and next year i wouldn't be surprised another thing to look another thing to look if he moves i also wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't move yeah well you look at the oilers draft picks and is this to bring really them the best up. team to compare our drafting to well no but look at a guy like ryan nugent hopkins Similar profile, size-wise. Comes in, expected to be like the next Joe Sackick because the Oilers hype everybody. Well, that's not him. And he's a now emerging as a good, dependable two-way forward who can play very well defensively and chip in some offense. And, like... Now, Euler fans are calling him Ryan Nothing Happens, which is amusing, but that's not, he's not that dynamic scorer, and he never was. Even in his draft year, he didn't have a ton of goals. It was just smart overall play. And we've seen with guys that they've tossed away, like Schultz and Yakupov. Like, now that they're on other teams, Yakupov's doing very well in Colorado now. Actually has more points than McDavid, which is amusing. And Schultz has won two Stanley Cups and has looked very good with the Penguins. So, 
it, this it is the takes same time with, the Flames it, went through with Backlund, right? I mean, he came in, yeah. fans were expecting he was going to be this, you know, phenom sniper, and that wasn't his game. And I think no, Backlund settled in very nicely, being a, a two way forward with some offensive upside. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, a lot of fans were like, oh, we should trade Backlund for like the last seven years. Uh, it's like, oh, we want to get so and so, so let's include Backlund in the trade proposals. Like, and. Instead of just letting the player figure things out, and like back Bennett's only twenty one now, I think, and still very young. Like, give me a break. It wasn't until Backlund was twenty five that he became the player that he has emerged as. So I don't see any real urge to rush things along and. Even if he, even if this is all that Sam Bennett ever becomes, he's still a very valuable player. Yeah, I, you know, I think if he, my big worry with Bennett though is, it seems like his camp may look at his value differently, and I don't, I don't think he's worth as much money as maybe he thinks he does. And hopefully, after two years, we'll have a good read of that. I don't want to be paying this guy for you know five million dollars a year. I think we got him in a very reasonable contract now. But you know what? We gave him two years to show what he's got. And like I said earlier, if he if next year the deadline he moves, I think it's very viable. If next year the deadline he doesn't move, I also think that's very viable. I think it's really up to Sam what happens. And Well, it's one of those things that you could also make a, an actual hockey trade in the next two years as well that involves Sam Bennett because teams will look at, oh, good center, maybe... You know, we can spark his offense on our team. We have this player that, you know, well, doesn't what, yeah, fit our system. Say, and, of all the young assets the Flames have right now, I think Bennett would be the one that we would all be most comfortable moving if the Flames had to make a hockey deal and move an asset. Um, you know, there's a lot of young assets both in Calgary and in Stockton we don't want to see go. Yeah, and it's not like you want to trade Bennett at any point. It's just... If a trade makes sense, like say the Seth Jones for Ryan Johansson deal came up, where like you're get each player is good, and they're getting swapped for one another, and it's just because Nashville needed the score and they had too many defensemen, and Columbus was the other way around. Well, the Flames could, in a year or two, require a trade like that. So who knows? But. I don't see like oh trading Bennett for like a third round pick or anything like that. I think you just hold on to him at that point. Yeah, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't give him away for nothing. But we know sometimes the deadline you can get more than a guy's worth. I mean, you know, our Red Obara was a great example of that. But you know, I I think Bennett needs some time. Like Matt has said, he's only 21. He's he missed almost a full season in the NHL. We've granted Gillies sort of an exception in fans' minds because he missed a year, and I really think that's the reason he's not in the NHL this year. I still believe that Bennett may have been rushed to the NHL. That's just my own personal opinion. I think he needed some time in the A, but you know what? It is what it is, and he's here. And I think he just needs to figure out who he is. I think he's trying to be more of an offensive threat than he's going to end up being. He needs to work on that defensive side of the game. And most definitely, he needs to work on the mental side and staying the heck out of the penalty box. That is what's going to tank his career, if anything. If uh, Sam Bennett stays in in the third line position, then do you see any time before Christmas with the current lineup with no injuries that Jankowski slots in, or is it still a waiting game for him? Honestly, I... It, if there's no injuries to the top nine, I'd just let Jankowski tear up the A. And there's no rush. Like, Jankowski in the playoffs will be in the team. It's just giving everybody time to figure things out. And you just never know with injuries, player struggles, this, that, and the next thing. There's too many variables that you can't predict for right now so it's just a waiting game and seeing and I'm sure that like if some players are really struggling like say Matt Stajan's career just craters and like he just shouldn't be playing anymore and it is a detriment to the team then I could see things getting shaken up 
organizationally for that to happen that hasn't happened yet but just a random example and knock on wood we'll see yeah we'll see it, it, there's too many things up in the air uh, but Jankowski will be in the NHL and he will start the t- year with the team next year I guess where it's I'm going just, is the Flames don't just make room for Janko at this point. They would have done that already. I think, like you said, it's either a guy is not playing well or gets injured. I think as fans, we have a tendency to like the newest thing, right? And as humans, we're the same way. We always like what's new and what's fresh. And as fans, we like the hot prospect. But sometimes there's value in keeping that prospect in the A and letting them light it up there. And I think you're right. If Janko doesn't make the Calgary Flames roster out of camp next year, something's wrong. Yeah, something drastically has gone wrong. And, like, even, like, later on in the year, like, say one of the top nine forwards is really struggling, you could just put him on the left wing and make Versteeg a right winger and keep everybody up the middle as is. So I think Janko's the first guy who gets a look from the AHL. Oh, same here. I don't I, think it matters I don't see what it. position gets hurt. I think they'll find a way to move guys around to get Janko up here. Yeah, because if a center gets hurt, obviously Janko comes in and replaces them. If a winger gets hurt on either side, you just throw Jankowski on the wing and you throw Versteeg on the other wing and you're, you're good or to go. Or even putting Stajan on a wing, depending on where in the lineup it is, and putting Janko at center. Yeah, there's lots of different permutations. There's just enough, you know, for a couple games for a short injury, I think. You know what? Yeah, there's enough ways the coaches can move things around to make Janko fit. Well, yeah, and if it's just a minor injury like Furland's, you can just do with what you have. and That's like, why Freddie Hamilton is a flame. Yeah, exactly. Hey, we got somebody banged up. Freddie, get in there. Is there popcorn on the bench like there is in the press box, coach? Um, I would like a hot dog, please. (laughs) So, Matt, I guess my next question for you then, looking at sort of this break that the Flames have and coming back after the break, when do you think we see the regular season debut of Eddie Lack? I really expect it to be in Vancouver. Looking at the schedule, when do you think we see Lack take the net? I don't know. Uh, When's the next back-to-back game? Next back-to-back is later this month, the 24th, 25th on the road. We play Nashville on Tuesday and St. Louis on Wednesday. Yeah, I'd expect one of those games to... I I could see Smith playing all of them, to tell you the truth, for the rest of this month. Uh, I There's no clearly weak opponent, and Smith's used to a heavy workload anyway... And the games are spaced out enough that I think that you could just run with Smith for the rest of the month and wait until... Because I know that they, they play New Jersey early next month and some other mediocre teams. Well, if you look at start in November, they have New Jersey on the 5th at home and then Vancouver right after them on the 7th, a day later at home. Yeah. And for a large part of November, they almost play every other day. Yeah. So I think you'll see... Lack get start getting a few starts in November, but no need right now. I should correct myself. He's already made his regular season debut. He debuted in the Ottawa game, but I'm talking debut as a starting goaltender, someone who's you know not coming in relief. Yeah, and honestly, Smith is able to play 60, 70 games, so like there's no dire need to it's not like Elliot Johnson where okay he's played four games he needs a break it's he can play 10 12 games without a problem and especially with the four days off it's kind of like skipping a game anyway so we'll see the flame schedule gets a lot more compact in November December they're playing almost every other day minus the Christmas break um january they play almost every other day right up until the bye week so i think we'll see a lot more of eddie lack come november yeah and plus you're wanting to get off to a good start and with smith playing as good as he has why not just roll with it and see how it goes that's it sometimes sitting a goalie will put him on a cold streak yeah and even the few days off who knows like we'll see I don't see there being a huge rush to get Lack in there. It's 
when it becomes necessary, then it will be. If I if I was going to put Locke in, if I was the coach this month, I think I'd do it against Carolina. I think that's the weakest of the opponents. And there yeah. might also be some approved there. I mean, that's the you know Locke's former team. They might want to do that. Yeah, I think uh, Dallas might be the other option because Dallas is kind of mediocre still. Yeah, the only thing is Dallas is a Western Conference team. Yeah. You know, if you're gonna give, if you're gonna give up points, you'd rather give them up to the East. True. But I can just see it because that was where we got Lack from, and I can see that sort of being the storyline there. Lack facing his former team. But we'll see what happens. I think you you're probably right. I think we see Smith for one, two, three, four, five, six more games this month, and after that we start seeing Eddie Lack join the rotation because we start to get a lot more back to backs. We start to get more games close together. And like in November, and we're playing, the Flames are on a two week, week and a half road stretch. Yeah, and we're playing a lot weaker opponents. Uh, you know, the next six games are mostly against good teams. Like I'm counting Carolina and the good team and Dallas and good teams. It's one thing, like if you're playing teams like Vancouver, who are kind of terrible, but you want to give yourself as good of a chance to win when you have your backup in and like say playing them against Washington that's not the best recipe for success on either you know you might as well just forfeit the game yeah I don't know the standings are weird this year though I mean we got the New York Rangers at the bottom of the east and we've got uh the Vegas Knights sitting in second in the Pacific yeah well we were 30th in November and we made the playoffs so that's true it's still early so Matt, why don't we take a look back at last week's poll? If you remember last week's poll, we asked fans about with the Flames win in Anaheim, how do you feel about the season? And did that win change your thoughts much? Were you thinking after that, you know what, if we can win Anaheim, we can win anywhere? Well, I was hoping that they would finally break that. So just that whole stupidity would get out of their heads. Should and we erect a Mike Smith statue at the new arena? Jobu. That might scare the kids. Yeah. If it's right outside. Well, the winner last week... Might scare week, the opposition, too, so... Maybe just erect it outside the visitor's dressing room. Yeah. Or permanently stick in the middle of the vis- visitor's dressing room. Put it on, like, a turntable. The winning answer last week was, uh, with the Flames win in Anaheim, how do you feel? Yes, if we can win in the Honda Center, let's plan the Stanley Cup parade route now. So I don't think people should necessarily go that far, but I think it is a good sign for the season. As you and I talked about in our preseason episodes, one of the keys to victory this year is finally breaking the curse, and it's happened. Yep. This week, we're going to have the poll topic, and you can answer it on firesidechat.ca, on Twitter at Fireside Podcast, or on Facebook at facebook.com slash firesidechat. And the question we're going to ask is, what would you do with Sam Bennett? Do you think it's time to try him on the wing? Should we keep him at center? Do you think he's just a young player that needs some more development? Or maybe you think, you know, it's time to trade Sam and get an asset for him before it's too late. So we want to hear what you think. Uh, Go to either our Facebook, our Twitter, or our website and answer our Sam Bennett poll for this week, and we'll read the results next week. We should trade him for a better beard. (laughs) Well, could we cut some of Yager's hair and form a beard out of it? Somebody needs to Photoshop that. I, I've seen some crazy Photoshops this week, actually. There was one backstage at the Dome when I was down uh, in the media lounge, and somebody took Yager's mane and made it into the fire on the Flaming Sea. It's almost like the old uh, Omaha Oksaban Knights logo. Remember when the Knights yeah. plume became the Flaming Sea? Yes. So, I don't know. There's enough hair going around on this team, if you you know don't put the captain in there, that I think we could find Bennett a beard. Or... Have you ever seen those toques, Matt, that have the beard built in? Yes. Maybe you can wear one of those under his helmet or if they ever play an outdoor game again. Yep. So I, I obviously you can grow a beard. The question is just how long did it take Bennett to grow it? Was that a whole off-season thing? Was that a continuation of the playoff beard? Or is that like one week of no shaving? I'd hope it wouldn't be one week of no shaving. Do, God, do you remember that, that movie, The Santa Claus with Tim Allen, where he shaves it all off and then he looks in the mirror and it all grows right back? Yeah, that'd be horrible. <laughs> it would be. It would be. But, you know, I don't know. I don't know if hair runs in the Bennett family. If it does, I feel sorry if he has a sister. <laughs> well, Matt, let's look ahead at the next week. We have uh, 
two games that will probably be played before we talk again on the 23rd. Both of them are home games. If you want to go to these games, make sure you check out our friends at TickTicks, TickTicks.com, or you can download the app on either iOS or Android. We got two games coming up, Matt. One against the Carolina Hurricanes on the 19th, 7 p.m. start time, and one on the 21st. It's a Saturday night game, an 8 p.m. start time against the Minnesota Wild. What's your prediction for the week? Well, considering Carolina is usually terrible in the Saddle Dome, and we're usually terrible in Carolina, and this one's being played in Calgary, I'm going to give us the two points there. Minnesota... I'm not as scared of them as I was last year. Like they they were a decent team last year, but I don't know. Uh, they're I think they're kind of going on their downswing now a bit. Losing Hala I think hurts them a, a fair amount. Like they're still a good team. They're going to be a playoff team. It's just. I think I'm the Minnesota as... game is really one where we see what Calgary's got. If Calgary can keep up with Minnesota, I think it really shows, okay, maybe the, you know this team is ready for a bigger competition come November. Yeah. I'm going to go with two points, play it a little safe, but I could if they, if they beat Minnesota, I think they'll be in a good spot. I think they'll beat Carolina. I mean, I'm a... I'm a fan of Carolina's goalie. I don't know if Darlene will play that one or not. He's a guy I want to see here. Um, so if nothing else, I'm curious to see how he plays with that sort of starter role now. But, uh, yeah, I think they'll beat Carolina. I think they're going to struggle a bit with Minnesota, but I think they might squeak out of it with one point. Well, if we go to overtime, we're going to win. So I don't know. It's automatic now, you know. Calgary is the best overtime team in the league, so... I don't know. Weirder things have happened. I, it, Yeah, I think Smith would be solid there, but I don't know. I can just see Minnesota sneaking a win. Yeah. Sneaking an overtime win on us. So we'll see how those two go, but they're both going to be fun games to watch. And uh, Matt, enjoy, I guess, the rest of the time off for the Flames. They got uh, today and tomorrow and then two games over the weekend, and we will chat again on Monday after two more games are played. Well, hopefully we're looking at a six or five or six and either two or three team instead of you know four and four isn't it nice though that we're not i mean we're not on you know like one and five at this point which is kind of where i expect we're not edmonton (laughs) edmonton like they beat us and that's the only win they've had i know well it wasn't edmonton that beat us it was Connor mcdavid that beat us okay well Connor mcdavid beat us but can't beat anybody else yeah, well, that's true to the Oilers. If McDavid's not doing anything, the Oilers don't do anything. And now that Drysaddle's out with the concussion, it, hopefully he's for them. He's back soon. Otherwise, the losses might pile up really bad, and they might miss the playoffs. Which you know we're gonna be so disappointed about here in Calgary. I mean, there have been pundits that thought the Oilers would win the cup or be in the finals this year. Yeah, well, they got to sell a product. Yeah, it's not even been Oilers products or Oilers people, though, they've said it. But it's uh, Oh, I know. It, well, they, they got to sell the NHL product overall. I don't know. There's... It's just like how uh, like we heard about Crosby being the best thing ever before the Penguins even made the playoffs. And like they were still terrible and... Yeah, they were saying, oh, the Penguins are going to be a contender, yet they hadn't even made the playoffs. But in that case, they backed it up. Yeah, but that also, you know, they had Malkin and a whole bunch of other things that the Oilers simply don't have. What, you're saying the Oilers don't? They have a complete team. They have a score and a goaltender. What else do you need? Yeah. There's 18 other players. There's some guys that are supposed to skate backwards and keep the puck away from the goaltender. I don't know. Chris Russell. Woo. Awesome. Number one. Number one defenseman. The Flames let him go. Yes. All right, Matt. Well, let's uh, give the Oilers a break. We'll see if, for their sake, they can come back fairly soon. I would like to see a competitive Battle of Alberta this year. As much as I like seeing the Oilers at the bottom of the league, I want to see the Battle of Alberta be competitive. I, I want to see them finish with just outside the playoffs with like the highest point total of anybody that missed the playoffs. See, I'd rather have us play each other in round one or two and just have us clean their clock. Yeah, I wouldn't. 
I don't want to see them. <laughs> you just don't want us to drive up to Edmonton uh, to watch the games. True. I, I'd i rather f- take amusement in them missing the playoffs entirely when they were expected to win the cup. That would be better. All right. Well, I'll, I'll settle for that. I think that would be okay, too. But if that's going to happen, the Flames better go past round one or the whole amusement factor is gone. True. Especially if we're like four and out. Yeah, well, we don't want any repeats of last year. Nope. On either count, the Oilers making the playoffs or the Flames going out in four. Well, Matt, let's uh, talk after two more games. At that point, we're, we're almost ten games into the season. We should have a good look at this team, and uh, we will talk to you next week. Take it easy. Thanks for listening, everybody. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.